Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, as we walk through uh, this, uh, one of the most popular and most often repeated prophetic verses during Christmas time, we're looking at these descriptors of Christ and, and what it actually means for this child to be born uh, with these characteristics. So Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, would you stand as we read this singular verse? For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. You may be seated. Today we're going to be looking at the reality that Jesus is our Mighty God, and that his name shall be called Mighty God. And you know, it's no secret that uh, if you were to take surveys of people in our culture and around the world, that there would be lots of differing opinions about who Jesus was or who Jesus is. You'd, it's really hard-pressed to find anybody who would say that Jesus was a bad guy. They will at worst say that he's a figment of history's imagination, that he didn't really exist. But that's a really minute number of people. Most people say, well, yeah, he was a guy, and he was probably a good teacher. Or it may be some would even say he's a prophet. Like there are some, some other religions that, well, we're not going to badmouth Jesus. Jesus was a great guy. He was a great teacher. He was a prophet. But that is not what Scripture says about Jesus Christ. There is no wiggle room about how the Bible describes Jesus. And this verse, in particular this title, says that he is and will be called Mighty God. It leaves no room for interpretation. Scripture gives us no room to wiggle and say, uh, to water down Jesus to make him less exclusive. Because make no mistake about it, the message of the Bible, the message of Christianity is that there is one way to be reconciled with God, and that is through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And the reason we say that, it's not out of arrogance on our part that we somehow figured it out. We didn't figure out anything. God revealed himself to us. God, the light of the world, stepped into the darkness. We didn't discover anything. God rescued us. And so it's not out of arrogance that Christians make this claim. It's simply the reality, the testimony of Scripture, that Jesus is our mighty God. This word mighty means exactly what you think it means. Strong, valiant, a warrior or a champion. In fact, Psalm 24 describes Jesus like this. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the King of glory will come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the King of glory will come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of armies. He is the King of glory. That's the picture of Jesus, this mighty warrior, this conquering king. And, and it was those notions that actually gave rise to some false ideas about what the Messiah would come to do. Because you hear that he's going to be a mighty God, and then Jesus shows up, and was Jesus a conquering king in his earthly ministry? Not conquering the things that people thought he was going to conquer, See, people thought that Jesus was going to come as a mighty warrior and, and cast out the invading Roman Empire and restore the national kingdom of Israel. But that's not the kingdom that Jesus came to topple. Jesus came to conquer the kingdom of the enemy. He came to defeat sin and death. That's who Jesus conquered. Jesus is the mighty king. And there might be people who would say, well, yes, Jesus is mighty. Yes, he did wonderful works. He might have even been a miracle worker. But Scripture doesn't say he was just a mighty miracle worker. It says he is mighty God. The Bible is clear on this. And if you've been around for our study through the Gospel of John the last few months, you remember that John 1.1 1, 1 clearly says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us that no one had ever seen the Father except the one who came from the Father. And He revealed the Father to us. He was the light, and in Him was the life of men. 
This is Jesus. Jesus is our mighty God. And so today I want to walk through how Jesus displays his might for us. Because it's very important. Might matters in our world. There's the old saying of might makes right. Only the strongest survive, those kinds of things. To the winner goes the spoils. The idea is that if you're strong enough and you can beat somebody else, then they kind of deserve to be beaten and you kind of deserve to win. We can use might as a tool of evil, but we must remember that this is mighty God. And so bound up in the might of Christ is the holiness of God. So there is goodness in this strength. There is perfection in this strength. There is all-knowing. There is all um, incomprehensible knowledge bound up in this strength. It is a perfect kind of might that is capable of accomplishing all that God has set out to do. So let's look at how Jesus displays his might this morning. One, Jesus shows his might by his works. Look in Colossians chapter, well, in Colossians chapter 1, we see this, starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Colossians testifies that Jesus demonstrates his might by his work of creation. That Jesus is the conduit through which creation occurred. John 1 has already told us that a few, several weeks ago. That there is nothing that he did not create and nothing that exists that he didn't send from his own hands. Jesus displays his might by being the creator. And by holding it all together by the word of his power. He demonstrated his might time and time again by miracles demonstrating that he had authority to cast out demons he had authority to to heal sicknesses he had authority to uh, to forgive sins he had abilities to to command the seas to cease jesus demonstrated that he had power over all these things he also demonstrated might in his teaching Now, Jesus was not a fire and brimstone preacher, as some would call it, but he was a powerful teacher. You know, whenever I first became a pastor, I thought I had to, I had to unlearn some things whenever I was expected to be in front of a church every week and preach God's word. I thought I had to find my Sunday voice, you know, you know, and no disrespect, but I listened to some of the old the old preachers from the bygone era and I couldn't do it I just couldn't do it and I couldn't imagine for W.A. Criswell and all of his many years of faithful preaching I couldn't imagine that that man sounded like that in a normal conversation I couldn't imagine anybody would walk around and be like well you know I was like I I don't have what are you doing and there there is there's this idea that whenever you are up in front of anybody, whether it's on a, in a pulpit or doing a drama in a play or you're in front, that you have to find a voice that will command respect and that will, that will be authoritative to those people. And here's what Jesus did. Jesus was just Jesus. He didn't have to conjure up a stage presence. He didn't have to find his voice. What did Jesus say? I speak the things my father tells me to speak. I do the things my father tells me to do. I'm not pretending to be something else. I'm not trying to get you to respect me by creating this caricature or this stage persona. I am here to tell you who God is and how he loves you and how you desperately need salvation. And what did the people do? 
this simple carpenter's son, they didn't say, well, we're not going to respect him. He hasn't found his stage voice yet. Now, people looked at him and they were in awe of the authority with which he spoke. They looked at him and said, this man teaches differently than all the other rabbis. And we don't understand it because we know who he is. We know that he's just a carpenter's son. We know that he comes from what we would consider almost nothing. But yet here he is commanding an audience, not because he has found his voice but because he is simply mighty as he speaks God's truth. Jesus consistently demonstrated the power of God. And when we think of might, we think of these grand displays. And we see that a lot in the Bible. That's, that's not a bad thing. God displayed his might all the times. Just, for example, in Israel's conflicts with the, with the Philistines, God would cause the Philistine armies to go in mass confusion and start killing themselves or send them into confusion and terrify them to where the Israelites would be able to easily overcome them. We see those grand displays of power. But in Jesus' teaching, what are those grand displays of power? It was the power of God's Word to pierce the heart of the hearers. It was the power of God to know exactly what they were thinking. The power of God to know exactly what their objections were. The power of God to know exactly what they were truly searching for. And Jesus displayed that time and time again. Why are you grumbling about this? Do not think to yourselves this. Why do you say I don't have the authority to forgive sins? Which is easier, to forgive sins or tell the man to get up and walk? And just to show you how powerful I am and how powerful God is and I am who I truly truly say I am, I'm going to do both. Get up, your sins are forgiven, take your mat and walk. Jesus did both. He demonstrated his might in his creative power in the miraculous healings and in his teaching of God's truth. Jesus also demonstrates his might by this, his death. Now some would say dying on a cross is not an act of power. It's not an act of might. It's not a, something a valiant warrior would do to just surrender. But do you remember what Jesus told Pilate? When Jesus wouldn't answer Pilate a word. Pilate says, you know that I have the power to take your life from you, right? And Jesus says, you don't have the power to take anything from me. I lay down my life. The only, you're only being allowed to do what God wants you to do. No one takes my life. I lay it down. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14 tells us that by this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering... He has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Jesus' might is demonstrated in his sacrificial death because it is finished. All the sacrifices that had ever been offered before, they were a, a shadow of what was to come. Those, sins ne- those sacrifices never took away anybody's sins. They were simply an act of obedience that God had commanded and he was putting off the final payment for that sin until the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And Jesus is so powerful, He is mighty God, that His death was enough. His death was the only one that was enough because your death wouldn't have been enough to cover all the sins forever for all of mankind. Your your death would have covered your sins. Jesus' death covered everybody's sin forever. And He's seated at the right hand of the Father, the A priest that had sat down was either being lazy or his work was done. And by the way, as the writer of Hebrews just told us, a priest's job was never done. Why? Because the people never stopped sinning. 
There was always new sin to be covered up. There was always new sin to be atoned for. There was always new sacrifices to be made, but not with Jesus Christ. The once and final and perfect sacrifice laid down his life and sat down at the right hand of the Father because it is finished. Jesus is mighty to conquer sin and death. He's mighty to slay this dragon to slay the master that has enslaved us for so very long, our sin. Jesus is the only one strong enough to break those chains. He's the only one strong enough to actually set you free. He's the only one strong enough to actually look at you and say, I gave my life for you so that you may live. Now go and live free. Jesus is the only one that can do that for you. And that freedom is only found by embracing the reality that He died for you. By submitting yourself by faith to God through Christ. That the mighty God surrendered His life for you so that you could go free. Jesus also shows His might by His resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 through 57 say that when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up by victory. Where death is your victory, where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Christ Jesus. See, the last enemy is death. And Jesus has conquered that enemy as well. We talked about how the word mighty meant this valiant warrior. And while the, the New Testament Jews believed that that meant he was going to be riding in on a white horse to conquer the Romans, Jesus instead rode in on a donkey to conquer our sin and death. That the empty tomb means... That not only the cross means we are free from our sin, the empty tomb means, one, that Jesus was telling the truth. That He did, in fact, tell us the realities of who He was. That He is God in the flesh. That He did conquer sin. That He did conquer death. It is the guarantee that you have a promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. You can rest assured that Jesus is telling the truth. Because no matter what grand claim anybody else has ever made across the histories of who they are and what their relationship with God was like, no one ever rose from the grave on their own power and stayed alive. Lazarus rose from the grave, but it wasn't on his own power. That was at the word of God. And guess what? Lazarus had another funeral at some point later on. Everybody that was ever raised to life in the New Testament, their family mourned their death eventually, but not Jesus. Jesus died once and is alive forevermore. He rose from the grave and he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father as our high priest, the one who has completed the work. He demonstrates his might over death itself in his triumphant resurrection. And it's in this reality that Scripture frames our faith as being born again to a living hope. A living hope. In order for our faith to be genuine, we must have a living Savior. If our Savior is still in the tomb, then He is no Savior at all. And we are wasting our life. But Scriptures and history alike testify that the tomb is empty. And then he appeared to as many as 500 people at one time after his resurrection. That he is alive and he is well. And so our hope can go marching boldly into the future saying, I follow a risen Savior. I don't follow a dead man's teachings. I follow a Savior who is alive and well, not just in spirit, not just in my thoughts, but he is physically and forever alive. And by faith in him, I can be as well. I could be made new inside and out. And on the, on the next side 
uh, after this life is over, I will have the promise of eternal life in that Savior's presence. Not because I've figured out some secret, but because He is a mighty God who has paid the penalty of my sin. He's a mighty God who has conquered sin and death that anybody who would believe would be welcomed in as His child. That's might. Our greatest foe, sin and death, have been slain by Jesus Christ. And lastly this morning, Jesus will demonstrate his might at his return. We see a shift from Christmas Jesus and Easter Jesus to Revelation Jesus. At the return, the might looks a little different. In his, the first incarnation... Jesus is piercing hearts with the sword of God's truth. And in Revelation at the second coming, he is destroying nations with the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. At the second coming, there will be judgment. And those who are in Christ will be ushered into eternity into his presence. And those who do not know Christ, who have not repented of their sins and trusted in Him, will be ushered into eternity, suffering under the just punishment of their sin. Revelation speaks of the nations gathering to wage war against God and His people. Spoiler alert, it doesn't last long. Jesus annihilates them. Revelation describes Jesus as eyes of lightning and feet like burnished bronze. This terrifying picture, it is not the sweet, cuddly baby in a manger. It is not the meek and humble teacher. It is not the kind prophet. It is the conquering king. That's who he's been all along. And there comes a time for a king to be gentle. There comes a time for a king to build. And there comes a time for a king to tear down. And at the return, he will gather in his people and we will worship him forever. But those who are without him, he will demonstrate his might and that they will bow and confess that he is Lord, but they will do so under the fierce weight of his wrath. But his weight, his might will be shown. And what we see here in this mighty God, the human idea of might, it corrupts us. It, it corrupts us. Our efforts to grow stronger in ourselves rarely lead us back to finding our strength in God. The old adage of absolute power corrupts absolutely is there for a reason. It's because the more authority, the more weight, the more influence people have, the easier it is for us to say, I don't need God. I don't have to be dependent on anybody else. I can do things on my own. And here is the reality, is that you are not the mighty God. You might be influential in your circles. You might have weight in your place of employment. You might be the leader of your own household. But apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Nothing that brings God glory. Nothing that brings eternally joyous fruit. You can muddle along or maybe you can make strides in the eyes of this world. But you are not mighty. None of us are. So let's heed the call of Scripture this morning. To find your strength in Him. Because here's the reality. A comforting reality for me. You don't have to be mighty. You don't have to be all powerful. You don't have to be strong enough to endure it all. You have a God of the universe who has made Himself available to you. And what has He told us time and time again? Run to me. Uh, let God be your refuge. Let Jesus Christ be your hiding place. Run to Him. Let Him be the source of your strength. 
Find your strength in Christ today. Ephesians 6.10 tells us to be strengthened by the Lord and by His vast strength. So many times we can simply run out of gas and we think, man, if I, I was just, if I just had a little bit more in the tank and we often get there because we're not relying on God. I'm not going to lie to you. It's been a long week. It's been a long week. We've had lots of rehearsals for Celebrate Christmas, and I got sick on Thursday and Friday. Uh, my wife is home right now with, with our youngest who is not feeling well. I'm not feeling well right now. I spent half the week just drinking a five-gallon bucket of cough syrup, <laughs> right? If I texted you on Thursday or Friday and it didn't make sense, I was probably texting under the influence, <laughs> all right? It's been a long week, and I've told some of y'all, how are you doing? I was like, man, we are just trying to make it through tonight. We're just trying to make it through tonight. We're just trying to hold it, on to get, hold it together enough. And as I'm preaching this message, I've realized that I've spent this whole week trying to muster the strength to get us through tonight that I've not really encouraged me, myself, or my family to say, we need to find our strength in the Lord to get us through this. But that's where we have to be. It doesn't mean it won't be hard. It doesn't mean like we won't feel like we're at the end of our rope. But if we find our strength in the Lord, then our strength will never run out. But all too often, we wait until we are broken down on the side of the road saying, God, I'm empty. And God says, I, I'm here. I've been here all along. I just wish you would have come to me sooner. Let's get, let's get you back going. Find your strength in the Lord. But also in this, that this mighty warrior has conquered your sin. He has conquered death for you. Would you find forgiveness in him? One of the things that so often zaps our strength is the reality of carrying burdens that Jesus Christ has tried to relieve us of. We're still hauling around things that he is and tried to unload from us, that he has commanded, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And yet, like, no, Jesus, I'm good. I think I can still carry this a little bit further. Oh, Jesus, you don't know about this burden I'm carrying. I can't let you know about that, which is nonsense. The mighty God who is powerful enough to conquer sin and death, he knows your sin. He knows the burdens you're carrying. Would you trust him? Would you trust that he is strong enough to carry those burdens? Would you trust that he is good enough of a God to forgive you of those sins? Would you let go of the weight that you're carrying of those failures? Would you trust that your mighty God didn't die for nothing? He died so your sin can be forgiven, not so that you can keep feeling guilty about it. Find forgiveness in our mighty Savior. Jesus, our mighty God, invites you to trust Him. He invites you to walk with Him. He invites you to enjoy Him. As we celebrate Christmas and as we do all of the things that may bring you warm, fuzzy feelings and may bring back a lot of great memories and sentimentality and nostalgia, none of those things are bad. Do you remember this? That Jesus Christ was born of a virgin at the perfect time, in the perfect place, in the perfect way, so that he would grow in wisdom and favor with God and men. And at the right time, he would give his life for you. Conquering your sin and your death. Rising from the grave so that you could have new life in him. As we close and sing, the invitation is clear. As it's been not just every Sunday that I've been here or every Sunday that this church has existed, but every Sunday, every day since Jesus Christ died on the cross, would you repent and turn from your sins today? Would you trust in Him? Maybe you are a believer, but you've been carrying around a burden that Jesus Christ took from you, and you've somehow wrestled it back from Him. 
Would you believe or would you cast your care on God today? Would you believe that He actually cares for you and that He's actually strong enough to meet your needs today? Let's pray. Father, thank You so much. Thank You for caring for us. And thank You for being mighty. Jesus, thank You for being the warrior that we need to conquer sin and death. The warrior that we need to to bring us to an end to ourselves, the warrior that we need that will fight the fights that we couldn't fight and cause us to lay down our lives and surrender to you, that you might give us a new life, an abundant life to follow you with, to honor you with. Father, help us to trust you in these moments. I pray that you'd rescue those who don't know Jesus, that they may know your might, God. That they, may know, they may know your goodness, they may know your mercy. Help them to trust in Jesus now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.